Well, good morning. I hope you slept well. Um, I was reminded this morning on my cell phone of the occasion uh, that you may know of when Michael Servetus uh, agreed to meet John Calvin, and uh, Calvin apparently risked his life in order to meet Servetus, and Servetus didn't turn up. So if you are the person who mistakenly sent me a text message on my cell phone, Calv, I'll see you at Canary, then uh, you got the wrong cell phone. Uh, Calvin's number is uh, off limits these days. Well, this morning we are going to be thinking, as you would see from the program, about the theme of beauty and the Holy Spirit. Uh, when you saw the program and uh, you're all well-schooled in the Latin language that killed the ancient Romans and now almost killing some of our young students, um, and you recognize the words uh, homo faber and homo sapiens, and you were struck by R.C. Jr.'s brilliant title portrait of the artist as a son of man, and then you came to this theme given for beauty, and you would have read in the program notes that this was to be about the Holy Spirit and beauty. These are two concepts that you may not have frequently put together, the Holy Spirit and beauty. So what I want to try and do this morning with you is not so much the portrait of uh, the artist as the Son of Man, but the tapestry of the biblical teaching on the Holy Spirit as the creator of beauty. And I want to begin with what to me is a very significant text in this context, and its significance I think will become clearer as we go along this morning, from the 27th Psalm, Psalm 27, and verses 4 and 8, Psalm 27, and verses 4 and 8. One thing have I asked of the Lord, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord, and to inquire in His tabernacle. You have said, seek my face. My heart says to you, your face, Lord, do I seek. The subject of beauty, as you know, has fascinated thinking people from antiquity. The early Greek philosophers pursued the, the true and the good and the beautiful. And still today, philosophers, uh, we were hearing yesterday about philosophers of the recent period who focused all their attention on the analysis of the language that we use when we describe things, and in some instances decided that when we use these great words, true and good and beautiful, then truth and goodness and beauty all simply lie in the eye of the beholder. And although that philosophy in part may have run its course, I think it would be true to say that in the world in which we live, the thinking of those philosophers has come down into the common thinking and common language of the people among whom we live. Uh, of course, the expression beauty is in the eye of the beholder is one expression of that philosophy. And we're certainly living in a time where good is also in the eye of the beholder, and truth has fallen to the ground as an objective reality and is also seen to lie only in the eye of the beholder. That may be truth for you, but it's not truth for me. 
We live in a world that has been so influenced by the thinking of the Enlightenment that we have lost all objective standards for concepts like beauty. And the words of this psalm, as well as other parts of Scripture, as we'll see, underscore for us that there is an objective standard for beauty, and that objective standard is God Himself. This is the reason why David longs to see the face of God, because for him the face of God is the quintessence of beauty. This is why he longs to spend his time in the house of the Lord, because in the house of the Lord, in the presence of the Lord, in the particular manifestation of the character of God that the temple or tabernacle was, there is a glorious display of the perfections, that is to say, the beauty of the Lord. All the days of my life, he says, I want to gaze on the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in His temple. And so there is an objective standard for beauty. Sometimes philosophers of aesthetics have suggested that one of the characteristics of real beauty is perfect symmetry. They say that's true of a beautiful face, that if you can take a photograph of that face and then fold the photograph in the middle and ear meets ear and the two sides of the nose are perfectly aligned and the eyes meet as the page is folded, the nearer you come to the perfect meeting of all the different parts of the face, the nearer you are likely to come to beauty. You don't need a piece of paper to do that, incidentally. All you need to do is look in the mirror and imaginatively fold the mirror in two, and in the case of some of us, and I include myself in this, you are likely to feel you're actually looking at a house of horrors, and there are no two parts of your facial anatomy that meet together. There is no symmetry to your face. And so you walk away from shaving or uh, whatever ladies do when they look in the mirror in the morning, and you groan under the burden of the fall and long for the day when not only will the body be resurrected and transformed, but the face will also be resurrected and transformed into perfect symmetry. But there's more to beauty than this, isn't there? When we anchor our thinking about beauty in God Himself, we understand there is perfect symmetry in everything God does. All that He does in providence has a perfection of symmetry with all of His divine counsel, and so there is beauty expressed in what God does in providence. But there's also something deep down in beauty. There is the expression of the perfections of the character of God balanced together, not one swallowing up another, but God being all of His attributes all of the time to all of His people. And then there is a further reality that I think at least subconsciously we are all aware of, and that is that beauty must have a certain attractiveness to our senses. It must attract the eyes. If it is an aroma, it must be attractive to our nasal sensation. If it is a sound, a song, then it must be attractive to our ears. And all of this is true also in the Scriptures, isn't it, of the Lord. This is why the Scriptures urge us to worship the Lord arrayed in garments that are appropriate to His holiness. 
to set forth in all that we do the magnificence of the outshining and the balance and the power and the fullness of the being of God. At the end of the day, I think we can say from a biblical point of view, the beauty of the Lord is simply His glory. That is the visible manifestation of all that He is in Himself invisibly to us. And so it shouldn't surprise us, for example, that Moses longs to see what the Mosaic administration can never provide. He longs to see the fullness of the glory of God. And yet, in a sense, he may not see the fullness of the glory of God, not simply because the glory of God is terrifying to the sinner, but because the glory of God is simply too beautiful for the sinner to perceive. And what we find running through Scripture is a theme that emerges from time to time. It emerges at the beginning of Scripture, and it re-emerges at certain places in Scripture, and it comes to a consummation right at the end of Scripture. And it's this thread in the tapestry of biblical theology that I want us to try and weave, or perhaps better to catch a loose thread on the tapestry and pull it and see where it leads us through the Scriptures. You might say, if I may borrow an expression from Augustine and the Westminster Confession and Thomas Boston, that we're going to look today at the Holy Spirit and beauty in its fourfold state. And beginning, first of all, with the inauguration of beauty in the first days. You might think from one point of view that the Scriptures have very little to say explicitly about beauty. But when we think of creation, unless actually we share Augustine's view that creation was actually an instantaneous event and Genesis breaks that down into parts in order that we may grasp it, unless you share that view of creation as a whole as an instantaneous reality, you understand that creation is described in the book of Genesis as a process. It is a process that takes place over the period of a week. The cosmos is not in the same form on the first day as it is on the sixth day. And so Genesis introduces the picture of original creation in a very striking way. It tells us that there was a formlessness about what God was bringing into being. And that formlessness, therefore, to us at least, would have involved a kind of lack of beauty. And within the context of that formlessness, there was an emptiness. There was, in some sense, a lack of content that would provide beauty. And in addition to that, the Scripture tells us there was darkness over the face of the earth, and a lack of visibility that would enable the perception of beauty. And so, the story of creation is, from this point of view, the story of how God, in the wonder of His progressive working, creates beauty out of that original stuff that was formless, empty, and dark. And if we ask the question, how did God do this? The answer is found, of course, in Genesis 1-2. The Spirit of God was moving over the waters. In our Bibles, I think probably this would be generally true of English translations, 
We are told that the earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And I have sometimes wondered, I am no Old Testament scholar, and you shouldn't take my word for this, but I've sometimes wondered if what Moses really meant was, but the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. That is to say, we are about to see God by the person of His Spirit doing something remarkable and marvelous with this as yet unenlightened stuff that He has brought into being, so that by the Spirit darkness will give way to light and emptiness will be filled with substance, and in the glory of God this formlessness will take on the beautiful form of the divine creation. And I recognize that when we read the first chapter of Genesis, the focus of our attention lies on that great refrain, and God said, and it was so, and God said, and it was so. And so we rightly associate creation with the Word of God, with the Son of God. But here, too, the principle that past Christians have understood, that in every action of God in which any person of the Trinity is involved, all three persons of the Trinity will in some sense or another also be engaged. And one only needs to think of the picture that Genesis 1 is presenting to us, that if God spoke words, if the Word of God is the mediator of creation, then that mediating Word is borne along by the breath of God, by the Spirit of God. And so we shouldn't disassociate the Spirit of God mentioned in Genesis 1-2 from the Word of God that follows time after time after time time, leading eventually to the result that God saw that what He had done through His Son by the power of His Spirit was good. Or in this instance, I think we should understand this not as moral good, although doubtless there is an ethic involved here, but good in the sense of beautiful. God saw that everything He had made was beautiful. And then when He had finished His creation in the making of man as His image, male and female, then He stands back, as it were, in the blessed fellowship of the Trinity with this enormous Sabbath day sense of satisfaction. And it's almost as though the three persons of the Trinity gaze at one another and say to one another, with satisfaction, isn't this perfectly beautiful? But there is another point that the opening section of the Scriptures makes, and it's this, that although everything was very good, although everything was very beautiful, it wasn't all yet finally beautiful. God planted a garden for the man, and the implication is, and it becomes clearer as Adam and Eve are excommunicated from the garden, that there is in this beautiful creation a garden, and that which is not garden. There is the garden in the east, and dare I say it, in the original creation there remains the wild west. There is a ruggedness about the wild west. There is a beauty about the wild west, but it remains the wild west. It is not yet garden. Perhaps I can try and distinguish these two things. Uh, when we first brought our family here on a visit to the United States, boys were very small, and uh, I 
uh, naively said to our host on one occasion, is it all right if my boys play in your garden? And these were very gracious hosts, but there was a look of abject horror and terror came over the face of our hostess, play in the garden. It was one of those ways in which uh, Great Britain and America are two countries separated by a common language. <laughs> I made no distinction between garden and yard as far as I was concerned. All was garden and all was yard. That was the way I'd always thought. But to her, in the yard, there was planted a garden. And the whole role of Adam in this context one might even say the reason why we're told in Genesis 2 that God breathed into him the breath of life, the reason the language is so clearly associated with the reference to the Spirit in Genesis 1-2, that God brings this man into being by the executive agency of His Holy Spirit and sets him in the garden and gives him as his image, his son, dominion over all things, is so that by the power of this breath that Adam has been given, he may take this garden in which he has been set as a child of God. The Father has given him a little beginning, as it were, as we do with our children. And then the Father says, now, I want you to grow up by extending this garden, by extending your dominion over all things until this beauty has reached into the wild, rugged beauty of the West, but transformed the West into a garden. So that for those of you who are gardeners, the great encouragement is that from the very beginning, Adam was created to be the gardener of all creation. He was given this little start. He was empowered by the Spirit of God, breathed into by the Spirit of God, made in such a way that he could have communion with God who had made everything beautiful but had made this earth not yet complete in order that Adam might share, might have fellowship, might have communion with him in the glorious labor of transforming reality into a condition of final beauty. And from this point of view, as we look at the whole of the rest of Scripture, and we look forward from Scripture, we may say, that man was created for the glory of God, to enjoy the glory of God in this sense, that he was made as a miniature. He was given the privilege of being a child of God to creatively play with creation and to extend the Garden of Eden. And then, of course, at the end, if the New Testament's perspective is anything to go by, at the end, what Adam would have done if he had completed this task, presumably with his offspring, it's a very big garden to create, he would have brought it back to his heavenly Father and said to his heavenly Father, it is finished we are made for beauty. And one of the functions of the wind or Spirit of God in the opening chapters of the Bible, and one of the functions of the Spirit of God throughout the Bible is to effect this beauty in our world and in our lives. It's an interesting thing, isn't it, that uh, the task of Adam in the Garden of Eden is not dissimilar from the task of the Levites and the helpers at the tabernacle and the temple. They are to, they are to watch over it and to, they are to keep it. And there is a little hint, isn't there, in the early chapters of Genesis 
that actually the Garden of Eden was the temple of God. It was the place where He would meet with the man and the woman in the, in the cool of the day with the refreshing wind of the late afternoon being a benediction to their fellowship. Eden was the place where Adam and Eve met with God. It was, we might say, the original temple in all creation. And God's charge to Adam was to extend the temple until it filled the whole earth. And so we learn something about the way in which the Lord inaugurates beauty in the first days. I want you to notice, secondly, the way in which the Lord provides the preservation of beauty in the wilderness days. Man is excommunicated from the temple. He now labors in the world by the sweat of his brow. Now it is the ugly that he has to make beautiful, and now beauty, as we all know in a thousand different ways, is hard won and difficult to attain. And when God creates His second child, as it were, when God brings this new community, His Son, out of Egypt, He leads them into the wilderness. And there, in the course of their wilderness wanderings in the midst of this drab and dreary desert, He provides for them right at the very center of their existence a magnificent hint, a beautiful creation, a tabernacle that will in due season, as it were, grow into a temple. We rarely associate this with the ministry of the Holy Spirit, but I wonder if you're familiar with the commentary of the prophet Isaiah on this whole period of the wilderness wanderings and the way in which the people were disobedient to the Lord. He describes the exodus as a ministry of the Holy Spirit. You remember how he says when they rebelled, they grieved the Holy Spirit. That expression that Paul uses in Ephesians 4.30 is not a creation of the apostles. It is the expression of Isaiah as he describes what is happening, and he suggests to us, doesn't he, that the Lord put in the midst of them His Holy Spirit, right in the midst of them, in the center of their existence. And in the language He uses about the Spirit leading them through the wilderness, He makes an association between the person and power of the Holy Spirit and these visible manifestations that God gave of Himself as He led them through the wilderness with the pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night, and set right in the middle of the people this tabernacle. And the details of the tabernacle, you know, if you're someone who reads through the Scriptures consecutively and you come to those chapters in Exodus after all the excitement is over, and then you're, you're looking at all these little details of the tabernacle and all the bits and pieces, and you think, I can, I can rush over this. But when you rush over it, you miss the beauty. You miss the color. You miss the grandeur. You miss the sense that what God is doing in the wilderness is giving a promise of the restoration of true beauty. And we read this, of course, in the book of Exodus, and as we go along in the book of Exodus, then uh, we come to all these details of the tabernacle and all the bits and pieces that are to be put together, the golden lampstand, the table for bread, the bronze altar, and this and that. And then all of a sudden we come across in Exodus chapter 28 this little statement that you shall make holy garments for Aaron, your brother, for glory and for beauty. And here at the very epicenter of everything that is going to go on in the tabernacle appear these 
figures who disappear as individuals in the beauty of the weaving of the clothing that they are to wear. And then, almost at the end of all this, if we will simply pay some attention to it, we come to these words right at the end that tell us not only are the priest's garments for beauty and glory, but God has raised up two men, Bezalel the son of Uri, son of Har, of the tribe of Judah, and that's uh, one of those statements that makes you feel, there they go again with these long family trees, and you are stunned by this statement. And I have filled him with the Spirit of God, with ability and intelligence, with knowledge and all craftsmanship to devise, listen to this, artistic designs to work in gold, silver, and bronze, in cutting stones for setting, in carving wood to work in every craft, and Aholiab is to join him, and I've given to all able men ability that they may make all that I have commanded you. And then he now tells you that all of these things that are to be part of tabernacle life are actually being created through the instrumentality of men only because they are filled with the Spirit of the Lord. And you stand back, and it becomes clear that in the midst of the formlessness and emptiness and often darkness of the wilderness, the Lord is actually preserving beauty for His people. And when all is done, what happens? The glory cloud of God the manifestation of His presence, the reality that they saw in the brilliance of the pillar of fire and in the pillar of cloud comes down and fills the place so that they cannot enter. And the reason they cannot enter is quite simply, I think, the same reason that in the Isaiah picture of the tabernacle of heaven, those amazing creatures cover their faces, not because they are sinfully terrified because they are sinless, but because there is a beauty in the holiness of God so intense that it is all-consuming. And this sheds light on something else, doesn't it? It sheds a little light on that strange little statement in Genesis chapter 4 about Jabal, Jubal, and Tubal-Cain, the three brothers. Sounds to me as though they might even have been triplets with names like that. The first is the man who engages in the scientific enterprise of animal husbandry and agriculture. The second is the man who is the first exponent of musical harmony. The third is the first exponent, apparently, of artistic originality. And you can't help wondering, since Moses has now, as it were, got to the end of the story that begins in Genesis 1 by speaking about the way in which the Holy Spirit makes men craftsmen like this to recreate beauty, whether we shouldn't now read back and say that uh, whatever the characters of these men may have been, the Spirit of the Lord was giving hints of order and beauty and harmony to fill the people with hope. And actually, we shouldn't leave the early books of the Bible without standing back and thinking that there is one thing the Spirit of God was giving that we haven't mentioned. In all its glory and beauty, He was giving sacred Scripture the very Scripture of which later on the Westminster Divines would speak about the harmony of all its parts. Isn't that interesting? That sense they had that what you have here in Scripture is like an entire symphony orchestra 
playing in concert one glorious symphony, and all under the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Thirdly, we must come quickly from the inauguration of beauty in the first days, the restoration of beauty in the wilderness, to the illustration of beauty in the new day, the first day, the wilderness day, and now the new day, and the restoration of beauty in our Lord Jesus Christ. I said these words in Psalm 24, 27 were significant, beholding the beauty of the Lord in the house of the Lord. That's the background, I think, to the end of Luke chapter 2, don't you? That's the reason why Jesus was in the temple. Actually, I believe that's the reason why His parents didn't thrash Him for His response to them. If I'd ever dared to say to my parents, you should have known where I was. <laughs> so why not Jesus' parents? Why was it not arrogant of Jesus to say, you should have known where I was? The commentators are hopeless and helpless. I don't know that they were ever children who were naughty and were thrashed, and so perhaps it's no part of their equipment. But here's the reason. In essence, he's saying, Mary, Joseph, you're the ones who taught me the 27th Psalm. You're the ones who reared me under God so that this day would come when I would want to be in the house of the Lord, inquiring of the Lord, seeking to behold His face. You taught me to be here. That's why you should have known that I would be here in order to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord in the house of the Lord. And you notice how Jesus' whole ministry is related to that temple. He visits it when he is twelve and longs to see the beauty of the Lord, but finds it not. He visits it again at the beginning of his ministry, and he cleanses it. He visits it again, and he cleanses it once more. And then we might say on the cross, he visits it one final time. And he tears the temple curtain in two from the top to the bottom and desecrates the temple because man has found no beauty there in the face of the Lord. For all the sacrifices of reconciliation, for all the magnificence of the priest's garments, they have not sought the face of the Lord and the temple of the Lord. And now Jesus has come Himself, yes, to fulfill all that that tabernacle and temple intended in the perfections of the beauty of His own being and life. This is uh, the reason why when you watch Jesus, what you see Him do is to restore beauty where there has been brokenness to restore symphony where there has been cacophony. His miracles, every last one, is, is just a little glimpse of that final restoration of beauty for which He has come into the world and which He will finally recreate. But in order to do so, as Isaiah says, he would need to be marred beyond human semblance, end of Isaiah 52, and he would need to be the one who had no beauty that we would be attracted to him. And yet on the third day, he raises the temple in the resurrection. And we find in John's gospel, don't we, in the narrative of the resurrection, this uh, this double entendre, which John loves so much, when Mary realizes there is someone there in the garden and says to him, if you have taken his body, show me where you have placed it. And John says, she said this supposing him to be the gardener. 
and He actually was the one who had taken away the body. And in truth, He was the gardener. And this resurrection was to be the beginning of the recreation of the garden. And He, unlike the first Adam who became a living being, the second Adam became life-giving spirit. And now at the beginning of the new creation, in the glory of His own resurrection, the recreation of the garden has already begun. And one of the things He is doing in that garden is building His people into Himself as the new temple of God. What the Holy Spirit is doing. Think about what we often describe by words like sanctification and preservation as the recreation of beauty in the stones that the Lord is building into His temple. And that what He is doing, you know, words like sanctification can have such a metallic ring about them as though what it meant were making sure with a kind of mathematical precision that you were doing exactly the right thing, when actually what sanctification is, is Jesus turning our lives into the likeness of His own beauty that we may shine with His glory. There's so much more to say about this, but I've time only to come to the fourth stage. Yes, there is inauguration of beauty in the first days. There's the preservation of beauty in the wilderness days. There's the restoration of beauty in the new day. And of course, there is the consummation of beauty by the Spirit in the final day. Now, we look forward to that day that Paul describes in Philippians 3, when by the power that is at work in him, Christ will subdue all things to himself. Or if we may put this in the terms of our thinking this morning, the Lord Jesus Christ, when He comes, will transform all things into a beautiful garden, and He will do this by the power of the Spirit who is at work in and through Him. And so, the disciples are told, stop gazing into heaven. The Lord Jesus will return in the same manner in which you saw Him go. He went in the cloud of the Spirit as He ascended to the right hand of the Father. He will come in the power of the Spirit when He appears in the final day in glory, and He will subdue all things to Himself. He will fulfill the dominion command, the gardening command that is given to Adam to make all things beautiful. And so it shouldn't surprise us that the new Jerusalem created by Jesus comes down and is described as like a bride on her wedding day. You would never think of saying to a man, young man who was uh, standing at the front of the church, I would never think of saying this. You're beautiful today. <laughs> but the door is open, and as ministers, some of us stand with the best place in the house beside this man who is waiting for this woman, and the, the door is open, and you can almost hear him gasp. I've never seen her as beautiful as this. And this is what the Lord Jesus is doing in the power of the Holy Spirit. This new Jerusalem that is brilliant, incidentally, in its engineering design that is filled with music, that has the most magnificent agricultural setting. It's evident what it is. There's a tree of, li tree of life planted there. There's a river of life flowing through it. It's a picture of the final restoration and the final consummation of divine beauty effected by the Lord Jesus Christ in the power of the Holy Spirit. And we're told in Revelation 22.4 that there at last the aspirations of Psalm 27 and of Moses 
are fulfilled, and we will see His face. With unveiled faces, we will see His glory. Interesting thing is, there are, there are two things that are absent, aren't there, in that final picture. The first is, there is no created light. God Himself becomes the light of His people. And the other thing is this, there is no longer any temple. And the reason? Because everywhere is temple. Everywhere is glory. And this is why the book of Revelation almost closes with these words, the Spirit and the bride say, come to the Lord Jesus. The bride says, come, because this is the great day of the wedding feast of the Lamb of God who has died to cleanse us from every spot and wrinkle. And the Spirit says, come, because it is in the power of the Spirit that the Lord Jesus makes everything beautiful. Now, why this pulling on this particular thread in the tapestry? Actually, I've said almost nothing practical, I think, because at the end of the day, this is the really practical thing, that the lenses through which I see the world, the lenses through which I see what God is doing in my life, the lenses through which I see the nature of my calling, the lenses through which I see the real ugliness of human life and sin are crafted, ground by this theology. And when I grasp it, I can never see things exactly the same way again. And that, my dear friends, is what makes it so practical because it makes us so different and helps us to see the beauty and glory of the Lord. May we be able to see that more and more. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, You have transformed the ashes of our lives into beauty. But we long to be more beautiful still for our Lord Jesus Christ, and we pray that in the power of this same Spirit, we may be transformed into His likeness from one degree of glory to another, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. Lead us on, we pray, for Jesus' sake. Amen.